34-17, the final score. BYU tops Georgia Southern for the final regular season home game of the season. The season finale coming up on Saturday as Georgia Southern will head atop the mountain to take on the Appalachian State Mountaineers. And to help us break down the App State Mountaineers, <laughs> some call him a professor, some call him the president, <laughs> some call him, well, some other things. But the TV <laughs> voice for the Appalachian State Mountaineers, David Jackson, joining us. David, appreciate you joining us, bud. Gentlemen, I can't even begin to tell you what an honor it is to be here. <laughs> the honor is ours, Mr. <laughs> Professor President. <laughs> Great to be back in Statesboro. I love this place, that place this time of year. Start there. What is your favorite memory of Statesboro? Um, to be honest, um, Chad Callahan, when he was volleyball coach at Georgia Southern, uh, former App State coach, um, one day rescued us uh, during a basketball season because we forgot that uh, there's a little thing called a blue law in Georgia on Sunday. And we were down there for Super Bowl weekend uh, and, and only had chips and salsa. And, and Chad came to our rescue. Um, that was special. That was special. <laughs> um, I, I, now, honestly, I will say this, and I, and I mean this with an all sincerity. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the rivalry here this week already. It's just the appropriate week to do that. And, and it's always fun to kind of rehash some old memories. And, and I was educating some younger fans earlier today on Adrian Peterson and what an incredible talent he was to watch. And we, we got into this discussion, and, and both of you can appreciate this, that Adrian Peterson was on the same level of a Steph Curry, on the same level with an Armani Edwards and Tur uh, Randy Moss, conference brand ambassador, you know, the, the, the kind of people that you could write a script around and, and know that, that that would hold up against the best that any other league or any other player at that time could, could do. So uh, we went back and watched a few YouTube clips, uh, you know, the, the old run against Youngstown and, and some other ones. And it, it, it just reminded me what a special talent that he was uh, and, and how our league was better for having guys like him and J.R. Revere and, and Josh Jeffries and, and some others, uh, Lewis Ivory, all, all um, you know, making uh, the SOCON such a powerhouse league at that time. Before we dive into what this year's App State team looks like, wanted to pick your brain because you were the longtime voice of the App State Radio Network. And being able to see Appalachian State through a lot of different lenses – what have you seen the last five, ten years from App State of how much they've grown from going from the SOCON to the Sun Belt to what they are being in the national limelight a lot of times? Sure, I, I think that's a great question, and I'm, I'm sure that a lot of Georgia Southern observers are trying to use some of that the, those same benchmarking tools. Uh, as, as you evaluate how you've gone and certainly getting ready to go through some transition, uh, where ultimately you hope to go as a program, and I think App State has done some of that knowing that we were on the same timeline. I look at it as a, as a measure of program maturity. Uh, you take it back to 2016, and App State, uh, in their third year uh, in that transition, played host to a nationally ranked Miami team. Uh, Brad Kaya was the quarterback. Uh, the, the Hurricanes had a little bit more sizzle uh, to them at that point in time. And, and Miami flat drubbed App at the Rock. I mean, it, it was never close. Uh, Marcus Cox had a long run, uh, a long touchdown run called back for a penalty, and that was all she wrote. That was the only chance that that app had to keep that game close. You flash forward just a few years, really one recruiting cycle later, and that same App State team goes down to Miami and plays toe to toe with a team that that is still playing for an opportunity at a bowl game this year. So I think that's what what I see. I see a bigger athlete, a faster athlete, a stronger athlete that that has come from recruiting with success at this level. And, you know, certainly Georgia Southern had a lot of success early, winning that first Sun Belt Championship bowl games um, uh, under Coach Lunsford uh, on, on the way to this point now. And I think that you would also argue that the athlete that Georgia Southern, the ap athlete that App State is going after today, looks different than the one that was being recruited in 2010, 11, and 12. Doesn't necessarily mean that that kid's heart's any bigger or smaller or, or the kind of athlete that these kind of programs get is any different from a, a mental makeup. But physically, there's a difference. And I, I think that difference has translated for both programs uh, on the occasional Saturday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday <laughs> uh, throughout this transitional period. What do you think about the fact that this is back at the end of the season for the second straight year, probably where it should be in terms of a lot of people on both sides of the ledger yeah. and being able to – 
end the season in Statesboro, end the season in Boone. I know how much it meant to people down here to see App in December after it was supposed to be on a Wednesday and then it got moved because of COVID. It seems like it's going to be on a Saturday and it's going to be here to stay. I, I love it like that. You know, I, I think that that's what uh, this new Sunbelt East has an opportunity to, to bring for us all, and that is meaningful regional rivalries, whether that means that App Georgia Southern play on the last week of the regular season, as I agree it should be, or if that's App Marshall or Georgia Southern Marshall, however we all work that arrangement out, um, you know, and, and the league schedules that, I think it's good for Sunbelt football to, to showcase its best rivalries and its, and quite honestly, usually its best teams uh, in, in a matchup like that. Uh, just the same on the other side where we see uh, uh, Monroe and Lafayette battling this weekend. You know, that that's what Thanksgiving football is is like, right? And And I like this a whole lot better than the old calendar used to be. It used to be that you would play – uh, at least from App's perspective. And remember, this all used to slot into alphabetical order some way. Sub, I believe, Wofford in for Marshall. It used to be that you go through Furman, Georgia, Southern, Wofford in three consecutive weeks. And, and for App, by the end of October, the meaningful games were over. You had this three-game run to the playoffs and hope that you got a good seed and maybe see one of those teams again. But I like it to where the meaningful games come at the end of the year. And you're, you know, for App, trying to trying to set themselves up well uh, to, to end the season on a good note, go to the, the Sun Belt Championship game with some momentum means going through an arch rival to do that. And I think that will make for some interesting theater on Saturday. Really good year. You talked about it with the victory over Troy this past week. They're in the Sun Belt Conference Championship game that's going to be the following week down in Louisiana. But it's an App State team, 9-2 and two on the year, 6-1 and one in Sun Belt play. But the first guy that we've got to talk about is Chase Bryce coming in at quarterback, transferring in from Duke after he spent time at Clemson. What has he meant to this? App State team. Well, yeah, I think he's meant a veteran presence with a veteran group of receivers. Uh, today we were talking at, at the press conference with Sean Clark afterward about just what this team looks like next year uh, for App State. And, you know, you, you say goodbye to some guys. You I mean, you, you joke, Danny, about me being the mayor. I think um, Thomas Hennigan was here when Daniel Boone walked through uh, <laughs> the town to found the place all these years ago. I mean, th these guys have been household names for a long, long time. And, and that's what this COVID – period has brought us right um, a, a, a group of for app state 22 seniors a lot of those guys playing a lot of those guys playing on offense so uh chase bryce was the complement to all of that you don't bring in a group of of savvy receivers like a hennigan like a malik williams and then trust that to a rookie to pilot that ship you know, I'll take you back in, in, in App State days here, App State Georgia Southern rivalry days a little bit. Let's talk about Joe Burchett back in 2000. <laughs> he was the last young quarterback that I remember App having with a group of senior receivers like this one would, would project. So back then it was Rashad Slade. It was Daniel Wilcox. It was a, a group like that. Troy Albee was another one. This group was set up very much like that. You know, you go get Bryce out of the portal. He brings you a stable, been there, done that kind of arm. Certainly he had to work through some things, but I think we can all honestly say too that he has got a much better offensive line uh, at, at App State than he did at Duke. And, and I think that's shown in his play. He's been a little bit more elusive and he's been a little bit more accurate in terms of his downfield passing because he's had more time to work with. That's an offensive line that's given up only eight sacks this year, third fewest in the country. And that's a thing that probably sets this year's offense – away from what the app offense has been like moving to the FBS. It's been a lot of outside zone, the stretch play, whether it's been uh, Tony Peterson calling the plays, but now Frank Ponce coming in. You can see elements of that, but it's been much more of a downfield passing attack, especially with getting Corey Sutton back. And when you have Malik Williams in the slot, that's something that not a whole lot of teams in this league can cover. You know, it's a little different setup, Danny, where it's pass to run rather than run to pass. Yep. And and for those that have watched App State over the course of now 10 straight years with a thousand yard rusher, you've seen it set up the opposite way that usually it's guys like Marcus Cox that are able to get into the secondary and loosen up a defense from the back end. And then you can start attacking that that mid to long range passing game. This time it's been the other way around. It is utilizing guys like Malik Williams in the slot, Corey Sutton on the edge, Hennigan being that that third down target that's been so reliable that that softens up the run. And, and App's run game has gotten better as the game has gotten on. Part of that is due to depth, but I think part of that is offensive patience as well and knowing that you know by the time you keep grinding away, Cam Peoples is going to get his 15 touches for 85 yards and you're going to get you know 100 and change out of Nate Noel and about the same. And, and the bulk of their yardage is going to come in the 
third and fourth quarter rather than the first and second because App is, is using their versatility to set up a, a good balanced offensive attack. What's the mood around this team? You know that now you're going to be locked into the Sunbelt Championship game in two weeks, but it is Georgia Southern. It is senior day up at the Rock. What's the mood around this team going into this game? They want it. Uh, you know, Sean Clark said today that unless a player was in a cast or a boot or needed a cane, that they were going to play this week uh, when when talking about personnel. Um, you know, there, there are some that would suggest, hey, maybe you lay back this week um, because of, of what's at stake next week. I don't think that that either side would ever lay back against one another. And, and that's what I think is so great about this game is that here, yeah, you, we've got all the postseason pecking order stuff sorted out uh, at this point in time in terms of the championship game. But this game means something. A lot of recruiting battleground, uh, trash talk opportunity that, that's out there between these two teams, certainly. Uh, they've had a history with each other. I think there's a score to settle for App State in this rivalry here, too, that, that you know, the last time that, that App probably had this much juice, maybe a little bit more back in 2019. But Georgia Southern was a team that came in here and ended those hopes. Uh, and there are still plenty of folks that remember what that pain was like and ultimately what that midseason game kept Appalachian State from having the opportunity to attain. So I, I think there's something there. And l let's be honest, on the other side of this, too, uh, there's an opportunity to, to write what has been a difficult season out on a positive script. And, you know, we all understand what the business side of this looks like. Uh, there are coaches that don't know whether they will be part of a transition or not. There are administrators, too, that that probably feel that same uh, that same element coming in this week. There's an excellent opportunity to write that script off on a, on a very positive way. Um, so, so there's something to be said there. There's a homecoming element of this too for Scott Sloan. I, I know that the last time he was here, he had a pretty good homecoming experience. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think there's with that comes though familiarity and and knowing that with Scott Sloan at the helm of a Georgia Southern defense that, in my opinion, has not been the issue this year. Um, you know, there's there's an opportunity to come in and play chess one more time with an old friend and 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 see how the the chips fall come you know, about five o'clock on Saturday afternoon. But uh, there, there is plenty of excitement. It's Thanksgiving week. Uh, students are coming back. The last I heard, there were about 100 tickets that were left for this game. Uh, and it, it'll be another um, a classic scene at the Rock like we've seen for so many App State Georgia Southern battles over the years. You know, we've already covered how you guys have stuck with your guns recruiting and how the caliber of athlete, maybe from the early part of the decade to the end of the decade and now into the 2020s has changed just a little bit. But you guys have also invested in facilities, opening the new North End Zone facility for $50 million. I, I joked that in 17 when we were up there, the Owens Fieldhouse was still there. 19 we went up there, the construction was beginning because the Fieldhouse had been torn down, and now this is going to be our first look at that facility just off to our left from the press box what has that meant to this program to be able to open a facility like that as this conference continues to move its way to maybe ascend to the very top of the g5 you know i, I think you bring up an interesting point in charting that progress danny because i think as the conference grows and as as we will see soon uh, a new a geographic alignment on this side of the country uh in this this side of the sun belt that is a whole lot more um, advantageous for Georgia Southern and Georgia State and App State alike. I think it is, uh, from App State's perspective, it's nice to have something coming out of the ground now rather than just having that process start. Um, you know, back in the transitional years in, in 13, 14, 15, 16, when, when Arkansas State was finishing off a new facility and Troy was getting into theirs and Louisiana was updating theirs, you know, I felt like App State and Georgia Southern were, were you know, they were so new into this, they were a little bit behind that facility's curve. Uh, and App has caught up uh, and, and now go into this new Sunbelt World Order with fresh new facilities it, it's certainly you know great for recruiting when you're building things and, and putting new buildings out and 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 it, it certainly is a whole lot nicer facility than owens Fieldhouse was <laughs> having some previous time in there but but i think it also um, speaks to the stability of the program where you've got a donor support uh, ticket sales uh, all of the things that drive that kind of change you're not you're not building extra facilities just to see a whole bunch of aluminum they're building these facilities because there's demand there uh, and, and it's, uh, you know, certainly premium seating on a day like Saturday might present. Uh, we'll have a premium uh, feel to it, uh, uh, cutting some of the elements out. But uh, it, it's just another another show, like you mentioned, uh, two programs that I think have, have weathered the storm pretty well. Take this year out of the equation. You know, I, I think that that in, in a traditional transitional sense, App State and Georgia Southern have done what the Sun Belt needed them to come in and do. And that is raise the profile of the league. And now partly because of that, 
um, you know, these two pro these two programs are, are set to be the standard bearers on a on an East Coast that's going to be awfully football savvy uh, by the time all is said and done. You look at the defensive side for this App State team, and it's always an App State team that has a really good defense and a lot of the same ca cast of characters that you've seen from the last couple of years. Demetrius Taylor, Sean Jolly, so many names that year after year after year. What has been the big key for this year's defense to set itself apart for App State? You know, I, I think that that every team that's successful right now can uh, across the country can point back to veteran presence and and certainly bringing guys like Demetrius Taylor, Demarco Jackson, uh, back into that mix um, certainly is helpful. Jolly has been, you know, uh, marred by injuries. Uh, this has not been the season that that he would have liked to have had, uh, but he still got opportunity there, right? You know, he's got a rivalry game plus you know at least two postseason opportunities coming up ahead of him. So so hopefully that'll work out well. I, I think with with this group though, maybe a little bit different than the offense. It, it's been some of the other characters that have emerged during this. You know, you you look back to to the midpoint of the year for Stephen Jones. Uh, when when all of a sudden every pass that was thrown in the air, he decided to catch and, and turn that into a national name for himself. Uh, one of the top uh, defensive backs in the entire country following Clifton Duck, uh, maybe in, in that that line of App State DBs that have gone on to play so well. I think a guy that, that doesn't get enough run right now is Jordan Earl at the nose tackle position is playing incredibly well at the front of that attack. And, and with those three down linemen playing well, Dale Jones has been able to dial up the blitz a lot more effectively. Uh, that pressure has has turned into turnovers, especially here over the last four or five games, where you have seen that look like a traditional App State defense, where pressure comes from the back in, and and all of a sudden, you know, you've got two or three interceptions at the end of a ball game, and, and you look up and Apps won the turnover battle. Um, this, this group has got some 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 newer names sprinkled in with it. I think it goes back to the veteran presence again, like I mentioned, but it is interesting to see some new uh, faces uh, start to emerge out of a group that, that will also, like its offensive brethren, uh, graduate quite a few people by the time uh, next year rolls around. Somebody that we've talked about, not necessarily on air, but you, Danny, and I have talked about the last couple of years, Sean Clark taking over as head coach for this App State team. He knows App State. He bleeds black and gold. Being able to see what he's done with his program, you've seen him from a couple of different standpoints. What has it really been like having him back at the helm? You know, I, I think that, that you guys can attest to what it means to have um, – what it means to have a Georgia Southern person at the helm of the Georgia Southern program. Yeah. Um, you know, I think with App State, you know, where you had such a long line, and, and let's be honest now, Jerry Moore was not an App State guy. He became an App State guy with his longevity. Uh, you know, he he helped give birth to Scott Satterfield from from not only a player's standpoint, but a coach's standpoint. You have the one year where Eli Drinkwitz came in and and took advantage of a lot of uh, a lot of the seeds that that Coach Satterfield and his staff planted. Now you have Sean Clark being the continuity guy that was was here that entire time from Satterfield's transition, stayed with Drinkwitz, and now uh, as the head of the program. Uh, despite you know the the easy the low hanging fruit here in this conversation to say, well, it's an App State guy that that's why. I think uh, uh, there's not enough to be said about finding somebody that can be that transitional link, uh, especially with such a, a a quick turnaround and coaching um, tenure here. It wasn't quite Arkansas State, but it was awfully close to it. So uh, having a familiar voice, having somebody that can build continuity and recruiting, keep some assistant coaches around that, that certainly means something there. Um, I think with our two universities here, and, and, and I say this as an App State grad, uh, speaking to, to folks that are very familiar with Georgia Southern, I think it, it matters when you have somebody understand where the opportunities are and where the challenges are, and, and not necessarily to accentuate challenges, but to stay away from them. There, there is efficiency that is gained when it, it's somebody that gets it at the helm of the program. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, how that, that transpires, obviously, with Georgia Southern's transition here. A little bit different script at the top, but how that staff is rounded out uh, to, to make that a Georgia Southern team. Uh, App State has largely stayed in that category over the course of the last several decades now, and I think that pays off in consistency of recruiting, 
Uh, certainly kids know what App State is looking for when they come out on the trail, and, and App knows what they're looking for when they go and try to bring in the next crop of uh, soon-to-be household names in, in this long-standing rivalry. And we covered the fact that you were the longtime voice on the radio for App State for 15 seasons, but you've been a professor at App State, your alma mater. You're also currently serving the Boot Chamber of Commerce, and from everything I see on social media, they are lucky to have you in that spot, and I'm not just saying that. But now getting back and doing what you're doing for your alma mater, what does it mean to you to be calling games for App again? That's a great question. Um, and first of all, you're completely full of crap. Uh, I really, <laughs> I, hey, I, best parking in Boone. Best food. parking in Boone behind the Chamber that's of that's Commerce. What it's about. That's what it's about. Danny is just trying to butter me up so I get that. Hey, I'm coming to breakfast on Saturday. Can I talk to your office? Yeah, so I get that. I appreciate that. It's, um, I, I've, I've enjoyed uh, jumping back into it. It's, it was uh, it was five full years out, um, you know, and, and certainly uh, Adam Witten's done a, a great job with, uh, with with the radio network side of it, and and it was important to me that that he sign off on on this opportunity for me to come back uh, in in this small way. Avery Hall is is working games with us again. I know a lot of Georgia Southern fans will remember our our dynamic duo back in the day, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, sparring back and forth with Nate Hirsch and the crew uh, back back years and years ago. Um, it, it was fun, you know. We we had such a great camaraderie there. I think that's the part that I've enjoyed more than anything is, is just kind of reconnecting with, with people that have been around and, and being able to tell stories again. Um, you know, certainly the dynamic is a little bit different. Uh, you know, despite what, what Eagle fans may think, we're going to try to play it pretty straight down the middle uh, on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I enjoy a rivalry broadcast. You know, I, I think that there is something that we can add to that storytelling. Uh, you know, Avery played in this rivalry. You know, I, I was certainly around for, for some of the most memorable moments of that. Wins and losses, tight finishes, blowouts. Um, yeah, I can remember many rides home from Statesboro wondering, you know, just how is it that this drive takes so long to get back? Because, you know, <laughs> it's just down in the dumps. But on the other hand, I think both teams have, have enjoyed their share of successes against one another. That's what I'm. That's what I missed um, in in not being able to do this for for something that that has a little bit more than just you know uh, quite honestly a paycheck attached to it. There's there's heart and soul put into into these kinds of games. I've been fortunate enough to 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 keep at it here over the last few years and and get a little bit more into the to the ESPN three side of it and um, you know certainly uh, have enjoyed keeping my feet in it, but uh, Saturday is going to mean a little bit something different and uh, it, it'll be fun to do that. You know, we, uh, the first game I called Danny, uh, not anywhere near on this magnitude, but was App State Elon uh, back at the beginning of the year. Uh, and that was another old SoCon rivalry rekindled. <laughs> there were some good years when Elon was actually relevant in the SoCon there for the 45 minutes that they were uh, and Scott Riddle and Terrell Hudgens and some of those folks were around. I know Georgia the Southern fans will remember some of those names. It was cool to strike that match again. You know, it, it, it was it was kind of like if you're going to play one of these games, it might as well mean something, right? And and you flash that forward to ending the year on a rivalry note. It's going to be awfully exciting. And and uh, I, I also feel for you guys at this time of year. Um, I know that your November uh, in my house November was a four letter word uh, back before <laughs> I, I decided to go do something else. And and I know you guys are grinding hard, but. Um, you know, you got an exciting basketball team to follow. I know that's a big part of it. And, and you guys are, are putting in the mileage and putting in the work and it shows as I've, I've been watching the last few weeks, you guys are putting on some great stuff. And, and I know it's hard to do at this time of year. Not everybody that should say thank you does say thank you, but I say having bled that blood before brother, thank y'all for what you're doing and, and bringing uh, what you are bringing to, to the Eagle fan base and, and to everybody that's trying to follow all these programs all over the, the, the direction in November. It, it does mean something to the folks that are tuning in. And I hope that you guys get that, uh, get that, that um, recognition um, for not only doing it, but doing it well. Man, I know what you were trying to butter him up for. What's he trying to butter up? That, that's a, that's a lot of soft soap. Good DJ. night. Good. <laughs> So there are a few places that you could hit on the food trail on the way up here. Um, you know, some old stomping grounds. No, no, I, I mean that sincerely. I, I think that, that that's one of the cool things about us going into this league together was that we brought um, certainly a rivalry on Saturdays and, and that kind of thing um, uh, to it. But uh, it's, it's fun doing this kind of stuff with your friends too. And, and there yes. are a lot of uh, storylines we get to continue to talk about, even though we, we may be in different places now. Uh, both in this year, uh, but but in this league, and and I know that that will only grow as as now uh, the the focus of the Sun Belt shifts to the East, 
and, and all these programs and all these national championships over on this side that that we, we've got to uh, to look at in the trophy case as we walk on by. Finally, before we let you go, you've seen this rivalry from a lot of different perspectives as an alum of App State, as a fan, as a broadcaster, as an ESPN Plus broadcaster now. What are some of the things that you really pull from this rivalry, and what are some of your favorite memories of Georgia Southern App State on the football field? And We've talked about it time and time again. There's been so many times where Apps one, Georgia Southern's two, Georgia yeah. Southern's one, Apps two, and it gets into a game of this game means a whole heck of a lot when you get to later yeah. in the season. Yeah, you know, my first trip to Statesboro was 98, uh, and that was a top five matchup. Yeah. That was one of those classic Adrian Peterson games. I, I tell you, uh, for, for my money back then, J.R. Revere was the tougher dude to deal with. Um, and all those defensive players, I mean, the whole entire team. Uh, you know, App could never get uh, a move in edgewise back in, in 98. Uh, that playoff game in 2001, you know, App got blasted up at, at Kid Brewer Stadium, thought they might have a chance to go to Statesboro and right the ship, and that was not the case. Um, but then, you know, you remember the 99 game uh, when, when App knocked off number one, yep. uh, did that a couple of times over the course of the, of the rivalry. I think those are always special. Um, I, I enjoyed seeing what complimentary players – came out of, of some of those things. I mentioned J.R. Revere, you know, the, the game where Adrian Peterson's 100-yard streak was stopped. I, I swear J.R. Revere is still running somewhere on campus <laughs> right now because he was the guy, right? He had like 3 million yards that day. Um, and, and there was always somebody, you know, whether it was a Jamal Jackson, whether it was a DeAndre Presley or, or Armani Edwards trucking my man at the goal line with a stiff arm that turns into a meme that we see every time or every year at this time up this way. That's what this rivalry is about. You know, and and I think it is it is proper and and quite honestly necessary that we respect it because both sides have had their day. It makes us better when both sides have our our, our day, and um, it, it makes it. You know, I, I think it's also to be said, um, and I don't think I'm saying this from a, a necessarily a position of bias. Uh, the minute that App State and Georgia Southern walked into the Sun Belt, they had the best rivalry in the league. Without a doubt. Yeah. And and I would take that up against anything that, that currently exists or existed at that time. So um, this sells tickets. It, it, it keeps fans of multi-generations engaged. It gives us an opportunity, like me today in my class, to sit there and go, App State, Georgia Southern this weekend. A couple of the students are juiced. I'm like, let me just tell you how it used to be. And I'm staying out a whole thing. Uh, so... So they're still bored with that conversation, but it got me <laughs> fired up for what's in store Saturday and, and what names we'll write into the record books uh, in terms of this rivalry as, as the ones that dictated the terms of this meeting here in, in, uh, in 2021. You said something in that that we've talked about a couple of times with this rivalry, and there's a lot of different rivalries around college football, whether it's just two teams hate each other, there's bad blood, but this is one and one of the few that I think – yeah, they call it hate week around here, but at the end of the day, this one is built on respect. I think you hate that you like them, and yeah. you don't want to admit it. Like, you hate that you want to go out to dinner with them after you it's, hopefully beat yeah, them. Like, it's, it's just hey, I've already built on respect. Breakfast and stiff arm me on that, so, I did not uh, stiff arm you. I need to figure yeah. things out first. Yeah, We're coming up yeah. from Atlanta. Well, you've already got the parking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. here we go. <laughs> but no, I, I think you respect what you want to be, right? And yeah. and I think that there was a point in time where App State respected, um, you know, before they won their first one, Six Flags that flew over Statesboro. Uh, that was what App aspired to be for years. And, and to be honest, Georgia Southern was the team that kept getting in the way, um, whether it was, you know, positioning at the beginning of the or, or, you know, in the middle of the race to keep you from seeds or or maybe being that team that knocks you out of the playoffs in 2001. I still think that, you know, that the national championship opportunity that would have been in 05 uh, is, is the game that I wish that would have happened that never did. You know, uh, and, and those, those two seem to be on a crash course. Uh, Furman was in that mix there as well, I yep. believe. Number but, one that it, year. It could have been fun. Could have been fun. So uh, I, I would say to, to close that out, though, um, you know, just know that that there are no goalposts aimed at any buses this week. <laughs> Remember, burritos are to be eaten. So you say. Grown. So you and, say. Uh, and hopefully we can get out of this with uh, with, with with just another great chapter and, and a long time rivalry and and, uh, and many more to come after this. David, really appreciate you taking some time. Go ahead and turn the heat on for us before we get up there. But it's going to be a lot of fun getting to catch up with you on Saturday. Looking forward to it, bud. 
Snow flurries flying in the air currently. Uh, we'll we'll try awesome. to dust those out of the way and uh, and get you ready for Saturday by the time kickoff rolls around. <laughs> so y'all have a safe trip up, and we'll see you Saturday. Thanks, Thanks David. Once again, that's the ESPN Plus voice for Appalachian State as David Jackson. One of the best in this business. He's been a lot of fun, a really good friend yeah. ever since I've been a part of Georgia Southern. And I know it goes back to your Citadel days, getting to getting to know DJ. And There's a special place in my heart for that guy. Oh, no doubt. And I'll tell you about my first year at the Citadel in 2011. I had never met David, so I had just known him as the guy that went nuts when at beat Michigan in 2007. <laughs> I'd never seen him before. So he walks into the press box at Johnson Haygood Stadium and thinking, okay, let's get to meet the... Speaking of which, we need to find Brownie in all of this sometime this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> we would need a separate podcast on a separate Facebook page. Yeah, and maybe some separate names. Anyway, that game, that 2011 game, the Citadel and Appalachia State... App got up 49-14 in the third quarter. The oh, Citadel scored funny. four unanswered touchdowns to get it to 49-42. App got the ball back with about six minutes or so left. They ran out the clock. They actually had a chance to score, but they took a knee. Jerry Moore was gracious enough to take a knee. I think it was inside the 10-yard line to end that game. But that was my first experience playing App State, and the Citadel-App State was a nice little rivalry for the three years that I was there, but it has no way to hold a candle to what App and Georgia Southern have had. Look, you can go back to 1932 if you want to, but since 1987, the version of the ice bowl that these two would like to remember in the playoff that year when Irk came out of the locker room with a T-shirt and shorts on and it was negative whatever it was, they sprayed the field with water so it was like an ice rink. Raymond Gross couldn't get any traction. They won 19 nothing. Really, ever since then, this game has meant something. Now, they yeah. didn't join the same league until 93. They've met every year since then, and that's over two different conferences. Yeah. That, that's something that probably gets lost in this. But like David said, one had to get through the other more often than not. I think it was a stretch of 16 out of 17 years. One of the two won a league championship in the yeah. SOCON. You hate that you love them. Yeah. You're not going to admit that. No. But there is a reason why there is so much respect between the two because each has their own way of doing right. No, and we've talked about it and. Off mic, we've talked about it with different people around the league. The Georgia Southern App State rivalry may be one of, if not the best, in the group of five. Yeah. It's at least in the conversation if it's not at the top. Because <laughs> because of the history like you just talked about, because of the respect that we talked about with David, and just the connection between the two. I know it's six hours between the two, but you play them in everything, and it's one of the few rivalries that goes across all sports because it yep. seems like even basketball mm -hmm. it, there's been years where one team's up here one's down here what have you but it seems like all sports georgia southern and app state there's a little bit extra for so long georgia southern was that independent team so yeah. they were having to do what a byu or a notre dame does now you're scheduling your full schedule every year you don't get eight of them taken care for you by the league that you're in so until Georgia Southern joined the SOCON in 93, they needed to find these opponents. And for a while, look, it was the James Madisons, it was the Marshall, it was Middle Tennessee, it was Bethune, it was Florida A&M. It was teams that you would see certain years, but you knew that when you joined a league, you probably weren't going to see very many of those. Yeah. Now, lucky enough that Marshall was in the SOCON, which I'm so psyched that they're coming back in, oh, yeah. in two years. I think that Huntington, is that's an awesome trip. Every sport, I'm really going to enjoy that, and them coming here, vice versa, and all that. But to really establish that first true rivalry, because every time they play, there is something to play for. Yeah. Close games, blowouts, number one, playoffs, big moments, long touchdowns, dramatic finishes. Some of the best games here, some of the best games there have been between the two yeah. in the history of the programs. And we we were talking about it before we went on tonight, how it's strange. You'll remember, and you and I probably, because we're weirdos, we're, it's true. we remember stuff from random games, but it seems like App State games, especially football, you remember a lot more than other ones. 2015, the laser pointer and the... Yep. the, the, the I the, still remember the dude's face when we found him in the stand. The cafeteria, the ambulance deal, the yep. fire. It was just... Yep. You, 
a league waste fumble return in 2016 on the bad snap in 17, how Tyler Bass kept Georgia Southern in the game until the fourth quarter. And I think I could tell you snap for snap what happened in the win in 2018 here. Yeah. I think I could go from the time that the teams took the field and App let the students know that they could hear them when that game was over. I know it was 7-7 in the second quarter, but that game was over as soon as App accepted the fact that Georgia Southern's fans and their students were in their ears that much. And I can just remember vivid details when these two were on the field against each other because it's just that good of theater. It's going to be another edition this weekend. Georgia Southern, Appalachian State, 2.30 the kickoff from atop the mountain. Do have one question coming in. On Facebook Live, Sean Ooh. wanting to ask, can we request that this game be scheduled at the end of the year, each year, to ESPN? And the thing that kind of gets lost in transa- translation a lot, the league sets the schedule, and then ESPN decides where games get picked up. And so, good on the Sun Belt for having this one, seeing what it was last year, mm-hmm when it wasn't scheduled this way because of COVID. Again, it was supposed to be a midweek game because of COVID. It had to be pushed back to a Saturday at the end of the season, which turned out to be phenomenal for both sides. The league saw that, said, that's what we need to grow the brand of the Sun Belt. And it's like David was talking about. Both of these teams, both of these programs, are what bolsters the Sun Belt to what it is going to turn into one of the top, if not the top, G5 league having it as a game at the end of the regular season I think means a little bit more because again and hopefully when Georgia Southern comes back in the next year or two being able to be fighting for the top of the Eastern Division yes up until Georgia State beat Coastal Carolina without Grayson McCall a couple of weeks ago you were still talking about they had to go through Georgia Southern to get to the Sun Belt Championship game correct and I know that is not what Appalachian State wanted to do by any stretch of the imagination. It doesn't matter what the record for Georgia Southern is because you can throw records out the window. And I know that's a cliche that a lot of rivalries use, but it, Georgia Southern could be 0 and 12 going into this game. App State be 12 and 0, and it's going to be a dogfight. I promise you. And you've also got the possibility in terms of scheduling flexibility that this game could have been moved to linear TV if necessary. Yeah. I think back to the end of the 2016 season, Georgia Southern was playing Troy at Paulson Stadium. Yep. Troy was playing for a Sun Belt championship. What happened was that game got bumped to ESPN2. So everybody got to yeah. see it that day when the Eagles on senior day defeated a really good Troy team back in 2016. Now that's not going to happen this weekend. But the fact that this is at the end of the season – and more often than not, it's going to be for that East Division. Yeah. And I think it's when Georgia Southern's able to get back right and both of these teams are at the top of the East, that's when you see, one, you're going to see that, David just talked about it, there's 100 tickets left. We're sitting here on Monday. Georgia Southern is 3-8, and eight, and this is going to be a 30,000-plus crowd-attended game. You see that. ESPN is going to take notice. They took notice last year enough to put it back on a Saturday at the end of the season this year for the Sun Belt. ESPN takes notice of that in the coming years. And I think this is one that year after year, and I know it's rivalry weekend across. You've got Georgia, Georgia Tech, Florida State, Florida. You've got so many different rivalries across the country. But this is a big game, not just in the Sun Belt. This is a big, really good football game across the country. This will make you a fan of college football yeah. if you, for some reason, are not a fan of college football. Look, Ohio State and Michigan is also this weekend, and yeah. that is the game which it's going to generate the most nationally, as it should. Yeah. That's a matchup of two teams fighting for spots in the college football playoff. But if you happen to trickle down and want to learn more about a rivalry that is just as intense but maybe not on as big a scale, these two aren't going to mess around. No, and I could see this one 100% in years coming up. This become the nightcap of Rivalry Weekend and turn into a 7 o'clock, 7.30 kickoff on ESPN2 to kind of wrap up Rivalry Saturday. I would be a fan of that. So, I, that's not me saying it's going to happen. That's me saying I could see it happening in the not-too-distant future. I know that this season was hoped to be much better than it has been, but realizing that your top rival is at the end of this week to finish this year one more time 
to have a smile on your face instead of just a frustrating end of the season. Even though Coach Helton is at the end of the week, he's officially going to take over as soon as the season ends, and we're excited about that. This is one more time to watch this group play. This is one more time to watch these two teams play. This is one more time to simply watch the best rivalry in the group of five. 2.30, the kickoff from Kid Brewer Stadium in Boone, North Carolina. It's going to be cold. It's probably going to snow. Just go ahead and buckle up for it. Hats and coats, hats and coats, <laughs> hats and coats. And then some more. Yes. But we'll be on the air starting at 12.30 with the Cutwater Spirits tailgate show. Frank, Russ, Terry, and myself will get it going. And then Danny, Terry, and Russ will give you the play-by-play story starting at 2.30 with the kickoff from Kid at Brewer Stadium.